the work that our speakers are doing uh, in real time to bridge the digital divide could not be more important for all of the communities across America to thrive and for all people to realize America's promise of equal justice under law. As we're about to hear, access to the internet and technology can enable our justice system and legal aid providers to operate more effectively and efficiently in serving the people they're supposed to serve in all income levels, especially in places and at times during which in-person communications are difficult or impractical. But those justice enhancements will only be available to everyone if we surmount the digital divide. And that's why the measures that have been discussed today by our prior speakers are so critical. To discuss these judicial and justice enhancement, we have a distinguished panel. Judge Jennifer Bailey has served for 29 years in the civil family and criminal divisions of the 11th Judicial Circuit in Miami-Dade, Florida. For the past 12 years, she led the civil division as administrative judge. She's not an ALJ, she's the head of the, uh, uh, the civil branch and uh, that's why she's called an administrative judge. She navigates, has been navigating the foreclosure crisis, the problems of an aging courthouse and the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Judge Bailey has served as the leader of the pandemic digital work group, setting up virtual courtrooms for Miami's state courts. And she planned and served as managing judge for Florida's first hybrid Zoom trial. Uh, Shelby King Gaddy is the executive director of legal services of the Virgin Islands, as well as its territory wide litigation director. Prior to joining uh, the organization in 2007, Shelby specialized in public and municipal finance, commercial banking, and real estate, and represented many public agencies and nonprofit organizations. She's the previous chair of the Access to Justice Committee of the Virginia, uh, the Virgin Islands Bar. Uh, Leslie Powell Bordeaux is the executive director of Legal Services of North Florida, which serves the Florida Panhandle. In addition to overseeing a practice serving clients experiencing housing and consumer problems, domestic violence, and difficulty accessing public benefits and health, Leslie has led her organization's response to more than 10 disasters, including the hurricanes and deep water, horas, deep water horizon oil spill. Uh, as a uh, additional uh, feature of her service, Leslie was a recent guest on LSC's Talk Justice podcast, and uh, we'll drop a link to the episode in the chat. Uh, finally, Dory Rappaport is the executive director of legal aid service of Northeastern Minnesota based in Duluth. The program service area covers more than 27,000 square miles. Dory has served as executive director since 2017 and has dedicated her legal career to building effective and sustainable legal services programs to ensure access to justice for all. And uh, Dory and colleagues from uh, Minnesota, Montana and Idaho recently led a highly rated session at LSC's uh, in Innovations and Technology Conference uh, earlier in January. Let's jump right to it. And uh, Judge Bailey, if we could, let's start with you. Uh, you serve on a uh, conference of uh, chief justices uh, and conference of state court administrators, national pandemic rapid response team, and your circuit court civil division has uh, embrace technology. But I'd like you to, for starters, go to the, I don't know if they were the bad old days or the good old days, but the pre-pandemic days and, and at, at least give us some sense of what the typical customer experience in state court was at that time. And then since that time, since the pandemic, what are some of the most uh, significant operational advancements in Miami and nationally uh, introduced in response to the pandemic and, and in particular, tell us what's working. 
Okay, well, first of all, the, the speakers so far are tremendously inspirational in terms of what's coming down the pike. But yeah, to look back at the past two years, uh, two, 2000, it sort of feels the same. Um, it's been an exciting, exciting couple of years. Uh, Pre-pandemic, I think the experience that most people had coming to court was pretty universal. There were a lot of mass calendars where you had to physically drive to the courthouse, which could be close or far, depending on where you live. Miami is quite a big jurisdiction. Um, and we have 2.5 million people in a single jurisdiction. It's about eh, in traffic three hours from one end of the county to another. So coming to a courthouse was no small task. You'd show up and there were a lot of people there. Uh, you'd have to listen for your case to be called. You might miss it if you weren't paying attention. Um, lawyers would be in the room. For those who are lawyerless, it certainly would seem like the lawyers knew a lot more about what was going on than they did. There were not a lot of um, structural educational opportunities that explained what court was going to be like. But uh, we, I think, delivered the justice within the confines of the traditions that we served. I think the real truth of what the pandemic did for us, and in terms of the quote from Bridget McCormick about the disruption we needed, not the one we wanted, is that it opened court's eyes to the user experience. We hold mass calendars because that's what was convenient for the court without really understanding how inconvenient it was for the parties and the barriers and burdens that that represented. We were lucky because we were online with digital filing before the pandemic. I will tell you that the barriers that came became very visible across the country as a result of the pandemic were the problems with requiring people to come to the courthouse to do things, whether that's to file papers or make payments. The, the low level barriers that we never saw, like wet signature notary re requirements and um, actual hand delivery of funds to be paid into the court register. Scheduling, um, when you're trying to schedule court hearings physically where your options were very limited based on what the judge had available. And then simply the paperwork challenges for people accessing information about how to fill out forms. A lot of times across the country, you had to come to the courthouse to get information or assistance on doing that. The court systems that most uh, easily pivoted in March of 2020 were those court systems that were already on some level of digital filing, that had online payment systems of one kind or another, and those who are at least aware of remote appearance. Um, and also those who had online scheduling, which I'll touch on in a moment, and had the ability to communicate with parties digitally. Miami was fortunate in, the, in, we, in terms of our following scenario. In civil, before the pandemic, we had digital court files. We had also built an online scheduling and file viewing platform that was universal. In other words, the lawyers used it, the judges used it, and lawyerless litigants used it. So for example, if a, an unrepresented litigant wanted to go on our system and schedule a hearing, they could schedule a hearing just like a lawyer by registering on the site. So we had a means and methods for communicating with people that existed pre-pandemic. Now it wasn't perfect and it wasn't universal because it did require use of our statewide e-filing portal which Leslie's going to talk about in a few minutes and which is kind of cumbersome. Um, Florida is not unified. We have 69 different court clerks, all of whom use this portal and there are a bunch of different rules for people. But it did give it, we, it, in order to address that, we created a system for text messaging by the third or fourth week of the pandemic. Because here's the thing, we pivoted really quickly to Zoom within 10 days, we had almost all of our courts on Zoom. But it doesn't do you any good if you can't get the Zoom location, the meeting number, 
in the hands of the litigants in a timely way. One of the things that I have worried about and continue to worry about is in Florida right now, we really have two systems of justice. For those who are on the e-filing portal who are connected to the court digitally, when I sign an order, you get it in an, in an instant. If you're not on the portal, you get it in US mail, which means five to seven days or more thanks to the issues with the US Postal Service. If I'm sending out a Zoom information and it's five to seven days, you may not get it before the hearing. So there's some real issues, not just in terms of actually the hardware and the issues with connectivity, but even utilization can be a huge problem. We chose Zoom because there are um, specific consequences for platform choice. And we specifically chose Zoom and Florida went with Zoom statewide by and large, the state provided licenses for everyone because we knew pro se's could use their smartphones to call in. And Florida has a very high penetration level with smartphones. So that way we could make sure that our lawyerless litigants could participate in hearings. And I will also mention to you as an aside, because it is Florida, that everything that we're talking about here is equally true for natural disasters. You know, we do hurricanes, but for everybody that's dealing with tornadoes, dealing with snowmageddons or whatever floods, whatever you're dealing with, you know, when courthouses have to shut down, the only alternative in a, that's really viable is replicating a digital experience. So here's what I'll tell you are the wins that came out of this. We saw barriers for the first time and we lowered some of those barriers with online notarization, with doing away with frivolous requirements for wet signatures. Innovations occurred like pay near me in Arizona where uh, Arizona went online with a system where you could pay anywhere. You could pay at the Wawa, you could pay at the 7-Eleven, you could pay at the Family Dollar, you could pay at the Walmart. So people no longer had to come down to the courthouse. Zoom has turned out to be a pretty good platform. Again, pl platform choice has consequences. There are platforms that you cannot participate in on a smartphone. And so, unless you're doing video and so, um, and on data. So uh, by allowing people to participate by phone through Zoom, we really um, found that that uh, amplified participation. And amplified participation is something that now we're getting the metrics on, and it is across the board. There are fewer defaults. There are fewer barriers to come to court in terms of transportation, travel time, childcare, work. People are less anxious. They're less worried. They're less fearful and worried about their safety. And it solves some of the remote geography problems that we've heard everyone talk about. Uh, an interesting consequence is everything is taking longer. Texas did a recent study, um, it's on the NCSC website, that demonstrates that um, remote hearings are taking about a third longer. Um, part of that is because more people are showing up. Arizona's failure to appear rate dropped by 87% in evictions when they went online. That's just epic, that's just awesome. And, and it's taking longer because more people are showing up and, and telling us their stories. And you know, that kind of means better justice. This was recently called out in an editorial in the, um, in the New York Times by Chief Justice Hecht of Texas and Chief Judge Anna Blackburn Rigsby from the District of Columbia. Then the headline was, hey, maybe it should take longer than 10 minutes to evict someone. The quality of justice I would propose to you may be significantly better on remote than it was in the good old days of the cattle calls. Let's not compare um, what we're doing with remote to anything but the reality before. And I will tell you full stop, showing up at a calendar call or a busy motion or pretrial calendar was not a rich justice experience. Um, 
is cause courts to look at how are they communicating with people. As I said, by the third week, we set up a text registry. So even if people didn't want to go on the e-filing portal, they could give us their, their text number. We would send them the Zoom information at the outset. Then we'd set them a reminder. And then we sent them another reminder so people didn't miss their hearings. The other advantage is people have digital file access. If you want to look at your file at three in the morning, you can look at your file at three in the morning. You don't have to conform to the opening hours of the clerks. By also by having people online, it gave us the ability to push education and push content out to them in terms of little YouTube videos of here's how to schedule, here's how to attend to Zoom. Do we wish, and, and both the Texas and Arizona reports call for it, technical bailiffs? Yeah, we need technical bailiffs. Here's the problems we have left to solve. Interpretation, we could do an entire seminar on that, you probably have, but I just wanna throw it out there. Um, the postal issues, which is a real thing that we need, cannot overlook while we're so used to emailing the represented, we need to recognize that those that rely on postal service are at a significant disadvantage right now. We need to worry about creating two levels of court, court for people on paper, which is a day late and a dollar short, and digital folks who get immediate access. We need to worry about utilization. So Ms. Rapp touched on this. Digital literacy is key, right? Removable type did nobody any good if you didn't know how to read or you couldn't get a book. So we all have a role in that. And it's a role across society as the previous speakers noted, because this is, everything's online now. If you're not online, you are a second class citizen as our society is shaping. And we need to bring folks along, whether it's for school, whether it's for dealing with the DMV, whatever it is, we need to recognize that. You've, you've covered a lot of uh, uh, critical ground. Uh, speaking of a lot of ground, uh, 27,000 square miles in uh, northeastern Minnesota, Dory. Uh, so you had to rely on remote service delivery and core processes before the pandemic. So how, how did the pandemic change things for you, uh, both for you and for your clients? Thank you, Ron, and thank you to LST for um, inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, and representing Minnesota in this national discussion. And we really are at this important juxtaposition where we're all deciding what are we going to take from the pandemic and make part of our permanent um, structure for access to justice. And I just wanna quick say um, thank you to my fellow panelists too, who I've had a great opportunity to connect with. And I wanna echo um, much of what Judge Bailey articulated. Um, and I, I just want to say a large ditto to, to the positives that you pointed out and, and what, we still, what we still have to work on. And we're in very different states, but, um, but the realities are quite similar. Um, and I, and I want to touch on, yes, the, the rural realities and, you know, the, the move to virtual and the move to remote really allowed us to access justice for more people. And so what that looked like for LASNAM was, you know, before we were doing the same thing where we were driving over this huge geographic area and picking and choosing, okay, what hearing can our attorney show up at? And, you know, is, is this one going to be more important today or um, are we going to have time to be at this calendar? And now with virtual, we've been able to stop that wind chill time and actually say, okay, we can schedule a lot of hearings and help many more people. And it's also allowed an organization like ours to function more as a cohesive regional firm instead of, okay, this office only represents these counties and this area. Now we can all help each other and leverage one another so that we can um, ensure that there's coverage where it's needed most. And speaking of that, you know, we have really shifted our focus uh, in light of the pandemic to ensuring that folks have representation in housing. 
Um, you know, we're seeing the ends of these eviction moratoriums. We're seeing uh, rental assistance starting to go away for individuals. And so we are very focused on keeping individuals housed. And our coordinated coordination and cooperative relationships with the courts have been critical. We have had housing, coordinated housing calendars in Minnesota, um, specifically in our region. We have calendars where we have multiple counties that are being heard by one referee who is now a subject matter expert in eviction. And we're able to staff those calendars. So there's a legal aid attorney, there's intake at every calendar. And so we're able to actually be there where we could never have done that before if it wasn't virtual. And if the courts didn't have the opportunity to, to put everything in one. I mean, this has just helped us help so many more people. We actually um, did an internal study and saw that we have talked to 50% more people. 50% of the people who we have helped in housing court were people who have never contacted legal aid before. So, but for our ability to be there, we wouldn't have been able to help those individuals in those housing proceedings. So virtual has been a total game changer when it comes to uh, representing more individuals in light of everything that's, that's happening as a result of the pandemic. Um, I just want to also say that, and I know this has been said before the pandemic, but um, virtual has allowed us to really leverage pro bono and ensure that we can move where, where there are more pro bono attorneys available. We can move that resource out to more rural areas. And, and that just can't be overlooked. That can't be unseen. Um, and that certainly has allowed us to really ramp up that pro bono resource when we're trying to deliver services. Um, and you know, as Judge Bailey said, we have seen a significant decrease in defaults. That's huge. That is so important. We can't unsee that either. We've seen that in both housing and family, um, particularly here in Minnesota. And you know that's that's because of a conglomeration of reasons. But people can now go to court and overcome the obstacles that were there before, like they couldn't get work off, or they didn't have childcare, or they didn't have transportation. Now they can sit in their car if they have to. They can be at home. They can go in a break room if possible. And it's just, it's just so different. So people are totally showing up for court and, and we have to ensure that that continues. And the last um, pandemic positive that I wanna highlight is we have been able to address for legal aid. And I know this is across the all professions in rural America, um, but we've been able to address the hiring crisis we have had staff attorney positions posted in um, locations where we had no applicants. And when we were able to take a leap of faith and offer these opportunities as virtual, because court remains virtual in Minnesota, we had more applicants than we had seen in a long time. And we've been able to hire onto our team staff attorneys that we would have never been able to have if we didn't have this virtual option and they're, they're doing outstanding. And so I, I leave us for now with, we can't unsee all these benefits. And I, and I hope that um, perhaps what I've shared has sparked some ideas or interests with other folks from other states listening to what we can take away from the pandemic as we move forward. Thanks, Dory. Uh, Leslie, uh... Judge Bailey and Dory have described some of the good things that have come out of technology during the pandemic. But we know that uh, these good things are predicated on clients having access to legal help uh, uh, for one, but in addition to that, affordable, reliable internet service, the right devices, digital literacy. Um, but those things are not a reality for many of the clients that uh, your organizations and other legal aid organizations serve. What have you done and your organization done to make sure that uh, clients are not left behind uh, as uh, uh, many other people are helped 
uh, with uh, more technology. Thank you, Ron. And I guess I'm the one who's going to break all rules of improv. And instead of saying yes, and I'm going to say yes, but. And um, my yes, but is there are people, to your point, who don't have that technology, even people who are fully employed making a good living who don't use technology in their day-to-day -day life. And this is something that's new for them. And so during the pandemic, what we found was, you know, people didn't know um, how to send a picture, how to take a, you know, do a scanned PDF on their phone. They didn't know how to use WhatsApp. They didn't know a lot of the tools that we were learning. And so we've had to teach them. And our staff um, was working with them to make sure they knew how to do some of these things so that we could communicate remotely with them. And I think the court system really needs to, to, to take on some of that burden because there are people who, for, for whom this is completely unfamiliar. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded that most um, low-income people who land in the court system are not there of their own choosing. They are being, they're, they're defendants, they are being sued. Um, certainly, you know, there's, there's exceptions to that, but, but this is a very nerve wracking process with complex layers and rules. And if you're also unfamiliar with technology, it's very easy to just throw up your hands and say, I can't get past this technology barrier to do these things. So um, I think the, the, the large point that I wanna make as the naysayer of the group is that um, is that we need to make sure we are opening doors and not closing them to others. I think that's just a really critical piece. I also serve rural, a rural community. I also serve uh, lots of, of elderly and you know, it's Florida, we have lots of elderly here. And, um, and so these are things that we've had to remind ourselves that just because there are those for whom this is better and it's absolutely true that there are many people for whom technology improves their access to the court, makes it easier for them to attend hearings, makes it easier for them. It, it, they may not need to get childcare and all those other things, but, but we don't wanna close the door to those other people. So, um, you know, one, one thing that I wanted just to share is we did hear stories of people during the pandemic who logged on to hearings, thought they were in the right place, didn't understand that it was a docket call, didn't stay on long enough, or didn't know that their case was called, didn't understand breakout rooms, didn't understand some of these things. And so they ended up missing their hearings. For some of them, they lost, you know, they ran out of data. They did some of these things that, um, that, that, that we often hear of, but they missed a hearing and were ruled against. And then we saw them after the, after the fact because they didn't, they didn't know what to do with that eviction or that small claims case that they may have missed uh, or that family law case, which, which may have been even more critical for them. Um, we had people who were coming to our office only because they didn't have access to internet. They didn't have another way to do it. So we set up conference rooms and offices for people who weren't even our clients to be able to, to attend hearings. Um, we, uh, you know, when, when we did full trials, which during the pandemic, we were doing full trials remotely, we, uh, we, we did that trying to work the technology in a way that you didn't have feedback and you didn't have um, noise from other people in the office next to you and, and other things that might not happen in a courtroom setting. Um, so there, you know, there, there, there are people who got lost in the pandemic, even though most of the stories are better and improvement. How can we make sure that, 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 that it's better understood? How can we make sure to continue that education? And I, and I do think there are people who will never want to regularly use technology. It's just not a part of their life. It's not a part of their culture. And I, I, I do think to, to Judge Bailey's point, there will always be people who prefer paper for various reasons. Um, and so just, one note before, I know I'm, I'm, I'm running out of my minutes, but one quick note is that there, are, there was another benefit, so I cannot be a complete naysayer, is that what we saw for the victims of domestic violence who we were serving is many of them felt safer. And I think that is a benefit that we, we can't ignore and being able to appear in a hearing and testify and not do it in the same room, room as the abuser has also been a benefit. Thank you, Leslie. Talk about running out of minutes, uh, <laughs> Shelby. Uh, when when we were talking in our our prep session, you told me that 
a, a client you were talking to had to hang up on you, her lawyer, because she was running out of minutes. <laughs> and um, if, if ever uh, there was an example, a, a graphic example of the digital divide, that's it. Can you tell us how does the digital divide look to your clients uh, in uh, the Virgin Islands? Well, I think there's two parts to it. And again, I want to echo my colleagues and say thank you for doing this. This is an important topic. And I think some of the speakers that came on before shared a lot of information. But one of the things that's most important here um, in the Virgin Islands is that while money has been allocated from Congress and all of that, you know, um, to use a term that I really don't like to use, there's a trickle down effect. It takes a while before the benefits will be, will be reaped by our clients. And so there it is. Yes, just a few days ago, I'm speaking with a client who had a housing issue. Housing is a critical part of our, of, of our, of our existence. And there she is. She wants to talk to, to me about a housing issue. And before she could even get her entire um, story out to me, she says, oh, but you know, I, I can't talk any longer because I'm running out of minutes. So it's not just a matter of um, the, I, I agree we have benefits of having the virtual hearings. We've had benefits of having um, our, our victims of domestic violence not have to be in the same room with an abuser. But when you look at the fact that in the Virgin Islands, it is 1.6 times more expensive, everything we pay for than it is in the mainland, even if broadband and, 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 and high speed um, access to the internet were available, many of our clients can't afford it. And then there is the other part of the access to justice gap that is created is that if in fact everything is going to be digital or by telephone even, and they don't have access to, to affordable um, broadband and internet access, then, then they don't have equal access to justice. Um, one of the things that, that, that as, as many of you know, our delegate to Congress, Stacey Plaskett, the Honorable Stacey Plaskett, I should say, she's already explained uh, across a lot of lines that most of the Virgin Islands is considered rural. So even if they could afford it, we don't have it available or accessible to them. So it, it, it becomes a situation where access to justice really isn't access to justice because many of our clients can't afford it. But while, while they have a device, they don't have data plans. And that's what I'm talking about when I say affordability. Data plans, we've made so many things available to our clients so that they can call us by telephone or they can access us online. Um, but if you don't have access to the data plans or you don't have the minutes available, it does you no good. So it has to become more affordable. The, the other issue becomes if they can't contact us in online or by telephone is getting to us into our brick and mortar um, uh, uh, offices. Um, public transportation, as, you, as we know it in the mainland, and I say we know it because I lived in the mainland for a while, um, as we know it in the mainland, is not existent on a consistent basis and a reliable basis here in the Virgin Islands. So our clients can't get to us. That creates a bigger problem. So if you can't get to us by public transportation, and then you can't talk to us long enough to tell us what the problem is, or even to hear the resolution, or for us to be able to get to you to provide a resolution, then that's still an, a gap in the access to justice um, wheel that, that we live in. So we have offered a number of options but again, those options are, are exclusive to those who either can get to our offices because we've made available in our office um, internet access, we've made available telephone access, we've made available the ability to sit in our office and do the hearings because we set up all these COVID uh, protocols so that we have uh, plexiglass there. But if you can't get to us, it doesn't really matter. Perfect segue to the some of the uh, challenges you faced before the pandemic, which is a steady stream of uh, hurricanes and other natural disasters. After Hurricanes Irma and Maria, both category five storms struck the Virgin Islands almost you know, simultaneously, seemingly uh, in 2017, mm -hmm. uh, legal services of, of the Virgin Islands really de mm -hmm. developed a, a creative and unconventional method 
to bring your offices to the clients, even though they were remotely located? Could you tell us about your mobile justice units and how they have made you a more resilient organization and more available to your clients? Yeah, as, as many people, we also saw the pandemic as a disaster. <laughs> so <laughs> while we were um, trying to recover from the, from the hurricanes that everyone called disasters of 2017, um, we looked at it with, with a theme in mind of equal access to justice anytime, anywhere. And so in doing so, what we did was we came up with, well, you can access by telephone, you can access us online. We wanted to bring justice to you. And what we created were the mobile justice units. We have one in each of our, 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 our districts, one in our St. Thomas, St. John district, and one in our St. Croix district. And those mobile justice units, as we call them, are, are really mobile offices. They have three workstations in each one of them. They have a satellite on top. Um, they have um, smart TVs for video conferencing. And as you know, one of the things that made us do all of this is that after the disaster, when people needed to access FEMA, the only way you could do it was either by telephone or by internet. And when the, when the internet in, in, our, in our jurisdiction was down, we were at a loss as well. So that's why we came up with the idea of putting a satellite on top of these mobile justice units so that we have our own internet, if you will, and our clients can also access the internet to do their, their, their FEMA applications and, and other things. Um, with, with, with those justice units, they also have, um, just to give you a little bit of idea about what they look like or what they do, we also have made them accessible. We have the, um, the ADA um, lift on the back of the, of the units. We have places where you can sit and talk to attorneys because we have our own satellites you can access with computers. And we're bringing not only an attorney, but also a support staff member so that we have two people working at all times. And we go out every week. Uh, we'll come back to you, Shelby. Dory, you, your program has also uh, promoted a uh, Justice on Wheels uh, solution to reaching your clients or try to reach your clients where they are. Can you tell us about that? As Shelby was describing her mobile justice units, it felt like she was describing our justice buses. Um, and so really the, the impetus and um, for the justice buses was part of a larger initiative um, of the Minnesota Legal Services Coalition called Reach Justice. Um, I absolutely encourage everybody to check out our website, Reach Justice. Oh, look at that, reachjustice.org, um, right in the chat there. And you can see some pictures of our justice buses. So there are four um, that are, are uh, bringing the wheels of justice to all of Minnesota and LASNAM is fortunate enough to get to host one of them. And they're, they're mobile legal aid offices. Um, we're able to bring them to community partner events, to parades, to on-site where other people are receiving services from our partners. Um, we're able to bring them access to us, access to technology, access to legal information, access to services. And so that's been, as we've talked about, we have 27,000 square miles. And so it's, it's great to have a unit that can help travel some of those miles where we don't have a physical office um, and where we can make sure we're reaching people that don't know still about legal aid services. Um, so it's been, it is like a moving billboard. They're really, they're really wonderful. Um, but the Reach Justice Project also highlights our legal kiosks. And so when Shelby was talking about um, the need to afford the technology, um, we had the exact same thought in Minnesota when the digital divide really presented itself right away in 2020. And we came together and were able to um, put out a collaborative ask for Minnesota to receive CARES Act funding and we received the funding and we were able to deploy 270 legal kiosks across the entire state. So you can see the kiosks um, on the Reach Justice website, or you can go to legalkiosk.org uh, and learn all about the, the kiosks there. But they are technological access points that are hosted by community partners 
And, you know, really the success of this project, aside from the collaboration between Minnesota legal aid pro programs, was what Secretary Torres Small said earlier today, which was those local partnerships on the ground are crucial to making any project work. This wouldn't have happened with our super short timeline if it hadn't been for those pre-existing excellent relationships with community partners and other justice partners. And so the legal kiosks allow people to go and get apply for legal services and learn and receive legal information. And some of the models also allow them to appear virtually for court, to appear virtually to meet with their lawyers, um, participate in mediations, negotiations, there's scanners, there's printers, and they're in private spaces. And sometimes these spaces, kind of like what we've talked about, are better alternatives than going to the courthouse. Um, some of them are with partners that are representing individuals that, were, that are um, survivors of domestic violence. And they much prefer to appear from a kiosk through our partnership than to go to the courthouse. Um, the kiosks have been a game changer and we're, we're really excited about that opportunity. It's been a silver lining of the pandemic to now have this opportunity to have a technological infrastructure uh, all across Minnesota. Um, and so we're really grateful for the partners at the table um, that allowed that to happen and uh, the benefits that this has provided all individuals, whether they're legal aid clients or not, have been, has been outstanding. There are people that are going there if they have a criminal hearing they need to appear for. Um, there are people that have gone for job interviews because they know it's a resource in their community that they can access. And so we're really, really grateful that we were able to do that. Thank you. Welcome back, uh, Shelby. Uh, <laughs> and now you get a real flavor of how it works here in the Virgin Islands at any moment. Your yeah, internet no, connection uh, completely well. illustrates the proposition. <laughs> uh, let's go through uh, a, a lightning round here of one minute answers. Uh, I've got uh, a question for each of you. Uh, Judge Bailey, what's on the top of your wish list that could help state courts further reduce the justice gap and the digital divide? If you can solve the problem in a minute, I won't be surprised. Okay, ready? Technical bailiffs to help everybody when they get on with all the literacy issues public Wi-Fi internet access, data plan support and reimbursement, a public-private partnership on internet access, on-site kiosks, remote appearance rooms and carols, public-private partnership for devices to let people check devices out to use them, plain language guides and digital literacy to all this, available across, across media, whether it's on paper, on, I don't know, airplanes in the sky, whatever. Partners, partnering with training agencies and high availability alternatives, utilizing people, meet people where they are for court, for payments, for all the ways they, for filings, for all the way they use court so that we can best deliver justice to everybody in the best possible way that it suits them. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, what's your What's, what's your prescription for the path forward for legal aid and service delivery to the uh, your client communities? I mean, I think we've talked about a lot of them, so I won't repeat. I will, this overall summary is just while we're opening doors, don't close any to anyone who can't use these resources and technology. I think Dory hit on one I think really is important, partnerships with libraries, community centers, and other partners to make sure that they have the information they need to help people who are trying to litigate and make sure they know how to find us when they need that training and, and, and help. Uh, and, and I think one thing that I just wanna tell a quick story on is I was talking to a friend who works with persons with mental illness on a regular basis and they were trying to help with the hearing and the litigant thought that every face on the screen was the opposing party and didn't understand all of that. And I think, you know, it was, it was a client who was schizophrenic who came with mental health issues to the table. And I think we need to make sure we're acknowledging some of those issues as well as, as we're trying to find solutions for everyone trying to access. 
Shelby, other than better connectivity for the uh, Virgin <laughs> Islands, what, what's what's on your uh, wish list, and what's what's your prescription for uh, moving forward in in a uh, in the digital age uh, in in legal aid? I think the judge's long laundry list encompasses everything, along with what Leslie has said. Um, I would include some way to assist seniors as they need access to justice as well. Um, they can't always get to us, even if we're the mobile justice unit. And, and if we can go to them, that works out. But we've got to have devices and things that would allow them to participate. Thanks, and thanks for your, your persistence. Uh, Dory, last word, what's, what's the uh, path forward uh, in the digital age for legal aid? That's it, Ron. We're going forward, like we're not going back. And so we need to continue to have virtual options. It's not, when are we all just gonna go back to court? We're going to continue to have virtual options. It's key to allowing people to keep accessing justice and to recognize that technology is a tool and a solution. It's not the only solution, but it is a critical tool for access to justice, but also really rural realities. It's, it's really key in ensuring that we're able to make sure that rural uh, Americans are getting access to justice. Thanks to all of our panelists, uh, not just for appearing today, but for really your uh, tremendous and heroic work as uh, on the front lines and the courts and uh, as first responders to uh, people living in poverty, your work is uh, critical and terrific. Uh, I would add also my thanks to everybody who's still tuned in, all uh, almost 300 of you. And um, uh, my last word is in evaluating uh, what our options should be of, as we move forward, we should never lose track of the client voice. Uh, I think there are a lot of experts, there are a lot of consultants, there are a lot of lawyers, we, we need to make sure that we're always checking back with our clients to make sure that what we think is the right uh, prescription to make uh, access to justice better for them, in fact, is. Again, thanks to all of you. Stay well and look forward to uh, seeing you all again soon.